But uh, how's the reading look, folks? Uh, so given there, there's a whole bunch of different moving parts to this to this stack of hardware and software that you're going to be dealing with there's Linux running C which is this purely software side except that C is going to interface to to real memory locations, to real I.O. locations, that is going to map to a bus, which is then going to be appear on the FPGA as a different address space. And then you'll be able to write objects in Verilog on the FPGA fabric. So there's several levels of abstraction here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. One of the uh, things I can no longer calibrate is what do people know about Verilog? Because uh, computer architecture has changed the way they teach and Verilog is now optional. And uh, so for many people, they've either never seen Verilog or the last time they saw Verilog was in 2300. So I have a couple of questions. If I say inferred latch, do you know what I mean? Hold up your hand if you know what I mean. Uh, okay, and if I say a blocking versus a non-blocking assign, do you know what I mean? Uh-oh, okay, so more than, maybe half. So, uh, I will talk a little bit about Verilog basics, I think, but that's not really the, the thrust of the course. Any questions about the reading so far? Let's talk a little bit more about the board and then start talking about lab one, which is starting next Thursday. When you get to lab, we'll show you how to set up the boards, we'll give you an SD card, although I could probably give you one before that. You have, to for, you have to format the SD card, load up the operating system, boot up the FPGA, and then start working on the, on the networking. And then if you get the networking done, start working on the lab. That's why the first lab is three weeks. The FPGA we're going to be working with is a moderate size device. It has let me zoom this up a little bit. I've become so addicted to touch screens now that I try and zoom the display up here. It doesn't work. The, uh, as you know, there's a dual ARM Cortex A9, which is actually internally called an ARM V7. Uh, 85,000 programmable logic elements. These logic elements are fairly heavy. They're six input uh, generalized gates plus two flip-flops and a carry chain, a couple of few other things. So they're fairly big memory uh, programmable logic elements. About four and a half megabits of, of memory on the FPGA that you can get to. It's organized as M10K blocks in Altera speak, which corresponds to 10 kilobits per block. You can use either the one of the IP managers or we will talk about style. You can, by writing Verilog in a certain stylized fashion, you can force Verilog to infer memory blocks in the hardware. And, and it will automatically concatenate them if you need more than 10 kilobits in, in a given memory uh, layout. But every block, every block on the FPGA, every memory block on the FPGA, and, and there's around a hundred of them, uh, can be independently addressed as a two port memory and independently read and written on every cycle. So you can have tremendous memory bandwidth if you can figure out how to parallelize something a hundred way. Like for instance, 
lab three. There's uh, some fractional PLLs. You know what a phase lock loop is? Anybody know what a phase lock loop is? Yeah. I have written CPUs for this architecture that run up to about 250 megahertz. They're awfully simple CPUs. The input clock is 50 megahertz. You use the phase lock loop to turn up the clock rate or turn it down. There's a couple of hard memory controllers. I haven't messed with those at all yet. In fact, there are many things on this architecture I haven't messed with yet. That's what I'm going to learn from you. There's some external memory, memory external to the FPGA. On the FPGA side, there's 64 megabytes of SD RAM, and there's an SD RAM driver, and there's a university IP core that uh, implements an SD controller. There's also a gigabyte on the HPS side, on the ARM side, which you're not really going to mess with. Linux is going to manage that. And you're going to boot off the SD card. There's two USB ports on the HPS side. There's a USB to UART, which is how you are going to boot this monster. You're going to hook up to the serial port on the FPGA board, plug that into the PC, open up a, 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 a PuTTY terminal as a serial device running at 100 kilobaud or so, I forget. I'll have to find that out. And log in that way. There's an Ethernet on the USB side. A PS2 mouse? What? Who would use that if you have a USB port available? But let's say that you wanted to put a mouse on the, on the FPGA side, another mouse on the HPS side so you can do two-dimensional, four-dimensional mousing. I suppose you could do that. You got, you got your basic 80 pins of expansion headers, which are uncommitted digital output. 3.3 volt, uh, you, uh, configurable slew rate control, various other things. A ADC input, there's a one mega sample per second analog to digital converter on this box. So you could build an oscilloscope, audio rate oscilloscope. You might even be able to build a direct conversion AM receiver. Anybody know what AM radio is anymore even? It's in the 500 kilohertz to 1.5 megahertz frequency range. It's amplitude modulated. Simple to decode on a, P, on a FPGA. Uh, full color VGA, a very nice audio codec, a television decoder which takes NTSC in. That's an obsolete standard. It's not transmitted anymore in the US or any place else in the world that I know of. But it also is uh, uh, used in closed circuit television quite a lot for like security systems, so cameras are cheap, easily available, and have reasonable resolution. I mentioned the ADC, and of course there's the usual switches and buttons because you gotta have that. There's a G sensor. There's an accelerometer on the thing. So, I'll know if you pick up the board and start shaking it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what else you use it for. I suppose you're going to hook this thing on a robot or you're going to make a really big quadcopter that could carry a board this big, then maybe you do that, use that. Now, th this is kind of a... Okay. Plus. No. What, how did I shrink it? I must have pinched it together, but I can't pinch it back out again. Oh, there we go. 
the way this FPGA is often depicted uh, is as an FPGA on one side and HPS on the other side. And this is really just to show you what's hooked to various uh, sides. All of the hardware side is hooked to the FPGA, except you notice that there's a switch on the I2C line that allows the I2C to be controlled either from the FPGA or the HPS side. And the only thing the I2, I would use I2C for is setting up the audio codec and the video decoder chips. Because it's so slow. Um, I don't think there's anything there worth talking about now. Any, any questions about that? Anything you see on there that... Yes? How come the 40-pin GPIO says times 36? 40-pin... <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it says 36 on there because each of the 40 pins have four uh, power lines on them. They have two ground and, and, and two uh, VDD lines. So there's only 36, there's 72 total yeah. data lines. Okay. Uh, so it says 3x UART USB. Does that mean there's three different USB ports with UARTs on them? Or is it like so wait a minute. Where, uh, I, think that means, I think that means three wires. Okay. Transmit, receive, and ground probably. But I'm not sure. Yes? Um, is there any shared memory between the two or is the only communication between the Axi bus? I couldn't have had a better setup question for my next slide oh. if I'd done it myself. <laughs> yes, uh, there is, and the answer is yes. There is a bus and there's shared memory. So, you don't care about the bottom side or the top side of the board, but let's go down here now. It's like, so, now this is the, the, the sort of logical way of looking at it. Uh, there's a bunch of special purpose hardware over here. There's some high speed transceivers on the Cyclone 5, except ours does not have those. There's phase lock loops. There's a hard PCIe on some versions of the chip, but not ours. There's a couple of hard memory controllers. The stuff that's interesting is that you're going to be looking at the, the big lookup tables, uh, the <coughs> block RAM, there's 86 or 87 multipliers, 18 by 18 bit multipliers, so that's DSP. And of course, routing to hook all this together. This interface is complicated and magical. We'll talk more about that. And then on the other side is the, the HPS. Drilling down a little bit further to find out what this interconnect is between the two, we now go and look at the the HPS core here. But let's go in and look at up here at this bus thing. There's actually four or five or eight connections between the HPS side and the FP, FPGA side. There's a control block that allows the ARM subsystem to write the FPGA configuration. So it that will actually instantiate hardware on the FPGA side. There's a high speed master on the, a bus master on the FPGA, FPGA side that talks to the HPS side. There's an HPS to FPGA high speed link. There is a lightweight weight link which seems to be m max out around 700,000 transactions a second or so. But there is also, as part of this control block, there's a 32-bit parallel port that appears on the FPGA and communicates directly back to the ARM. And One to six masters, it says over there. And the masters appear to be masters for the 
SD RAM controller on the arm. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? But most of the communication, most of the, let me zoom in now on the middle part of this. Most of the communication between the FPGA and the, <coughs> and the arm goes through the L3 main switch. So as far as I can tell by reading the documentation, the FPGA is cache coherent with the two CPUs. And this has several implications. One is that you can write from either CPU to the same I.O. ports without worrying too much about ordering, although you do have to worry some. And that you're limited in bandwidth by this thing. There's a bypass, there's something called the ACP mapper, haven't looked at this at all, that appears to bypass the cache. Oh dear. It bypasses cache and writes directly into some other control unit. Haven't messed with that. I don't know what it does or how careful you have to be with it. Since it bypasses part of cache, you'd imagine that it could be dangerous. Then there's a low speed switch that takes you out to the to a 32-bit peripheral bus where there's a whole bunch of microcontroller like peripherals a watchdog timer uh, four timers a couple of CAN bus controllers clock manager reset manager basically you're not going to mess with those you're going to assume that Linux is handling those for you. If you want to read the time of day, you read the time of day using the Linux call. Not by firing off a timer on the core. If you need extremely high resolution time, then you'd build a timer, you'd build a counter on the FPGA side where you can get 20 nanosecond accuracy if you want or even higher and run the timer over there, not try and mess with the uh, hardware timers on the, on the core, on the HPS core. Any questions about this? So, By way of trying to figure out how to teach this course, I did some programming. I figure I spent about, before I, I can stand up here and, and, and not feel like a total idiot, I spent 500 hours trying to figure out how to do it and I probably scratched 10% of it. So uh, I wrote a few pages. Linux on HPS we already talked about last time. HPS USB is really short. It's really how do you, it's really two, two articles from Stack Overflow. How do you read a keyboard? How do you read a mouse? P threads was pretty interesting. The P thread uh, formalism is very cool in Linux. There is an extension. It's not part of P threads, but it's part of the standard, which is uh, for semaphores. And all of that just works. You can fire off several threads from a given process. They will migrate across processors. They will communicate coherently through semaphores. It just works. <coughs> FPGA interface using slash dev slash mem is really me hacking around the first time trying to figure out what the hell is going on. 
I'm not sure you want to look at that because some of that's uh, the, the, the setup is kind of head scratchy and, and weird. A lot of good information, in fact, the setup for, for Lab 1 is going to be in this university computer and UDP. The university computer is a set of peripherals, it is a Verilog, is a Verilog and QSYS design that shows off almost all of the abilities of the FPGA, including a few we're not going to use. And it's a good thing that they supplied this because setting up QSYS is so complicated I never would have figured it out without the example. So what I did with the, the university computer, and you could download the, 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 the full version off of any of the lab machines which has the university uh, package on it. But <clears throat> the university computer includes two microcontrollers that run on the FPGA. And with the big ARM cores, it's not clear to me you actually need the microcontrollers, although they could be useful for real-time control where, you, where you, you don't want an operating system getting in the way. But I'm not going to emphasize this because it is yet another C compiler and another tool chain. I'm just going to, so I wiped the, the NIOS controllers off of the example <coughs> and threw away a couple of more things I didn't see the use for, but you might. And concentrated on getting a set of peripherals on the FPGA that made sense to use from the HPS side. So VGA, yeah, computer graphics, audio input and output, switches and buttons, LEDs and hexadecimal display, seven segment display, and a couple other things. The default computer that ships with the system is 16-bit color, but 320 by 240 resolution. It appears like they decided to use just half of the onboard memory for the VGA display. And the reason for using onboard memory is that it is dual ported, and so you can read and write at the same time with no conflict. The VGA has to have pixels when the VGA controller wants pixels. And your process, whatever it is that's writing pixels, would like to just totally ignore that, hence you need two ports on memory. I thought it looked a little crude, so I changed it to 640 by 480, but that lowers the number of the number of bits in a pixel to just eight bits. So you only have 256 colors. You're not going to do, you're not going to do photo accurate rendering, but for a user interface, it's fine. And I hacked around a little bit and then finally decided I, I chopped out too much stuff and went back and redid it. And this is the system you should use. A better chop down system is the title, and that is the project zip you are going to want to start with. Minimally, for compilation, of course, you need your source code. You're also going to need an address header that. I modified very slightly from the university distribution to reflect the fact that the segment for, for display memory was now twice as big. And uh, one or two other things. I didn't like the way, I didn't like the, the way it was set up in one or two cases. <clears throat> and for the first lab, you're going to be programming up a version of Conway's Game of Life. It's a cellular automaton, which is compute universal. It <clears throat> uh, 
Let me make sure I said everything I wanted to say. So in the in the in the VGA screen, we're going to treat each pixel as a cell. So each cell has eight nearest neighbors corresponding to the cardinal directions plus the diagonals. So this cell has eight near, nearest neighbors. And the transition rule is that at time t plus 1, at time t plus 1, if a cell has 0 or 1 neighbor, it dies of isolation, and so it transitions to a zero. It, tra it, it, it becomes a blank. If it has four to eight nearest neighbors, it dies of overcrowding and goes to zero. If it has exactly two or three, it survives. In other words, it doesn't change state. And if there's exactly three, a, a, a dead cell goes to one. And that's sufficient for compute universality. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is to, I'm not going to ask you to build a Turing machine. A Turing machine has actually been built in this universe. It requires an active area of several thousand by 10,000 or so and has hundreds of thousands of moving parts. We're not going to do that, but I am going to ask you to build an interface that allows you to erase individual pixels, draw individual pixels, and erase and, and draw two predefined shapes. One is called pi, which consists of th well, that's three pixels with an open side. That's supposed to be a pixel. And it makes, it makes a, a nice, long-lasting, symmetric picture. And the other is a Gosper glider gun, which is a, uh, you can look up. So you're going to have to hook a mouse to this. You have to figure out how to do that. You're going to have to add uh, switch support for it so that you can connect to the switches on the FPGA to change the mode of what the mouse means and to start and stop the uh, simulation. And, but for the first lab, it's primarily a C exercise. It's primarily a Linux C exercises. This will be the only lab for which this is true. <clears throat> So let's just take a quick look at this address header so that you know what I'm talking about. If you look at the, at the HPS internal manual, there's a gigantic memory map of peripherals, thousands of peripherals. And this is a few of them which are predefined. And in particular, there's a, the heavyweight bus is in the C8 region, and the lightweight bus is in the F2 region, FF2 region. And you're going to need a lot of these names. There's a span which says that you're going to need about hex 80,000 words for the, for the uh, 640 by 480 display and a whole bunch of other low-level gory details about the memory map, which sooner or later you're going to have to mess with. All of these offsets here, pixel buffer control bases at hex 
3020, audio bases is hex 3040, those are offsets are all relative to the base of the lightweight bus. And on the FPGA side, there's going to be a map that takes those into specific peripherals. So now let's go back over to the Yeah, let's go over to the QSIS side for a minute. Let's go over to the, so they go to this Avalon Busmaster thing. We're going to go down to VGA Display Busmaster with HPS. We'll look at the QSIS layout. It's a fairly simple one. Fairly simple. Displays badly. So let me blow it up a little bit. There is a phase lock loop, which is going to be the system time. There's the ARM high performance system which includes a reset line, an input clock, the axi master, the other, another axi clock, the axi slave, the lightweight clock, the lightweight master. And those are going to be wired by means of a, of, a, of a wiring matrix to various places. In particular, if you follow the clock line, the clock line and the reset, it's hooked to almost everything. Of course. So as we scroll down, we see that the clock and the reset lines are connected to almost everything, including SD RAM, on-chip SRAM, a module called AV Config. <clears throat> AV Config has the logic so that at reset time it can reach out through the I2C port and configure the audio codec and the video codec. So AV Config actually touches hardware outside the FPGA and sets it up the way you want it. The Pixel DMA address translator does something. I haven't figured that one out yet. VGA subset system generates, takes buffer, buffer data in, takes a, 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 a pixel map in from memory and synchronizes it with a VGA sync state machine internally. So it generates a vertical sync every 60th of a second and it ger generates a horizontal sync at whatever the, at 22 uh, at 25 megahertz divided by uh, 640. It generates a pixel clock at 25 megahertz. <clears throat> and then in the ki in this case, which you won't have for lab one, but you will have for lab two, I included a bus master. And throughout the course, what you're going to be doing is writing bus masters. What the bus master does is to is an interface between random v, uh, a Verilog that you write on the FPGA side and the Avalon bus, this thing. So <clears throat> it gives you a way of, of controlling the Avalon bus, which in this case means controlling the VGA but you can also do, you can control anything else on the Avalon bus. Now if we go over to this side, we see things like, oh, the, the AV config, which is a, a bus slave, has an address of 3,000. So those 3,200, 3,000 kinds of buses our addresses are all offsets that are defined in QSIS and have to match the address file in the address header in C. <coughs> so going back now to the university computer and UD
Let's look at, you've, you've seen the address header, so now let's look at the actual H, HPS program that's running on, on the core, on the, on the ARM core. And <clears throat> we're going to include a whole bunch of stuff, of course, because you always do. Uh, some of this is left over from other examples. For instance, sys slash IPC is for interprocess communication. So if you want to do a shared memory interprocess communication or a, or a, 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 a FIFO inter, uh, interprocess communication, you can do that. <coughs> I think you're probably not going to want to do that. I think you're probably going to want to spawn threads which share memory and so you can do direct shared memory high speed uh, data sharing between, between threads. MMAN is one of the big ones here. The memory manager allows you to map real physical addresses into virtual addresses and that's what this is all going to be about. Most of the most of the, pro the program is actually mapping virtual addresses. There's my header file for for the uh, for the addresses. Next there are a bunch of uh, function prototypes for graphics primitives, text, box, line, disk, Then we have to define the lightweight buffer, the lightweight bus virtual base. And what we're going to do is to, oh, and, 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 and pixel buffer and character buffer. We're going to, uh, to define a file ID because we are going to ignore the shared memory because what we're going to do is to is to open a device and the device we're going to open is slash dev slash mem which is a formalism that allows us to to do the map from real memory to virtual memory and you get to specify so the, the, file, the file descriptor is going to take a file, it's going to take a, uh, uh, a read-write uh, parameter, and it's a good idea to trap errors on all these calls because you, you don't want the thing to just fail with nothing. And since you are running an operating system, there's somebody to notice the errors, unlike an embedded system you actually can get a, an error return that makes sense. So once we've opened the file, then we're going to get the lightweight virtual base by doing an mmap call. And Null says, put it wherever you like it, I don't care. This is the span. It is a, it is a uh, estimate of how much memory you're actually going to map, and it must be in units of pages. Tells you whether it's uh, uh, allowed for read or write. Is it shared or not? The file descriptor. And then the actual hardware base that you want to map into virtual space. And what's returned is then a virtual address corresponding to this. How embarrassing. Except I don't know that number. So, um, uh, yes, and then we're trapping the error again to make sure that we actually mapped something. So after this, at this point, now we have a virtual address that we can write to or read from that corresponds to a physical I.O. port for the duration of the program. 
And we're going to do this for the lightweight bus, for the character buffer, because there's a VG, a separate buffer for text overlay from the graphics. And then we're going to, we're going to map a pixel buffer the same way so that we can manipulate those three with our graphics primitives that we defined up here. Sometimes I can zoom this and sometimes I can't. So, then going back down through here and, and going over a little bit of stuff we, we, we skipped, I wrote a macro to write a pixel because it was faster than doing a, a function call and I was going for speed here. So, this writes a VGA pixel at XY location with color, color. And it really just does a, 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 calculates where in screen space we are. That's fairly cryptic. I'll tell you about that later. And assigns a color to it. That then gets mapped across the heavyweight bus, across the heavyweight bus, to the FPGA, FPGA side, routed through the Avalon bus to VGA memory. And once we've done all that, then we can just use well, what appears to be much more sort of natural looking C code, we can just write text to the, we can write a box, writing a, a box of value 0, 0 to 640, 0 to 640 and 0 to 480 is screen clear. That draws a big black rectangle over the whole screen. If you said 0 to 640 instead of 340, three, what would happen? Seg fault. And so all of my graphics routines check that. Text clear does exactly what you expect it to do. Clears the screen. Get time of day is the Linux call to start a timer or actually get a time. This happens to be the life pattern for a a pie or the, the this little this little pie shape here. And we're going to init the initial array the array and then just iterate through adding up all the nearest neighbors adding up all the nearest neighbors and setting pixels according to whether or not they need to be written or whether nothing changed. And I started originally by by using a uh, updating the array by copying the new time step to the old time step but in the optimized version of the code, which is the second link in this little block, I just use memcopy, which is much faster. And you can, you can read the timer again, do the, uh, do, the, um, do the calculation to find out how long one frame takes, and you will find throughout the semester that you're going to need this for documentation. You're going to use this timer code over and over again for all kinds of stuff. Because in particular for the Mandelbrot set, it's required that you give me the time for one frame. If we go down here to the, the graphic stuff that I just inlined because it was easier to keep it together. If we draw a rectangle, oh man, this was some stupid code, let me tell you. Uh, 
So I had to define a swap because I didn't want to figure out how to increment backwards through a loop. I just swapped it so the, the, it always went from low to high in both x and y. And then it makes sure that all of the boundaries are valid because, again, you're right outside the boundaries. Kaboom! Then it does the pixel arithmetic here and writes the color. So you're going to pretty much expand this code to include mouse support and to read the switches on the FPGA side. So you're going to be iterating this thing as fast as possible because it looks coolest when it's moving fast. Have any of you uh, ever played around with Conway's Game of Life? So it's, it's pretty entertaining. This is a Gosper glider gun here. It's, a, it's a, about a 40 by 20 region of pixels following these very simple rules that emits an infinite number of gliders that fly off the screen. And gliders are a, a, a slang term in, in game of life for uh, self-propagating structures. And by the way, this was the first example that a, a pattern could grow without bound. And there are person centuries of investigation that have gone into this. For instance, there is a known pattern that fires four glider guns at a region and builds another glider gun. Oh, how long did that take to figure out? This, this, is, this is really seriously geekly. But pretty cool. And there's all kinds of optimizations, including sort of exponential uh, time improvements by, by doing pattern storage. But the fastest I could make this system go on 640 by 480 was about 60 frames a second. So that's fast enough to do a very, a very good quality animation and to watch patterns evolve for thousands and thousands of generations. The first time I implemented this particular automaton was on an Apple II in BASIC. And a 40 by 40 region took almost a minute to update one frame. So I rewrote it in 6502 assembler. Got it up to about 10 per second. But that was on a 40 by 40. This is 640 by 480. <clears throat> what should the boundary conditions be? I don't know. What do you want them to be? There's at least three possibilities. Boundaries are always zero. Boundaries are always one. Boundaries wrap along the horizontal and vertical to make an infinite repeated domain. <clears throat> so, you're going to have to, for this lab, you're going to have to look at the C code. You're going to have to look at the QSYS layout of my chopped down university computer. You're going to have to figure out the address of the switches and use that address to read the switches. Read up a little bit on this and, and, and come back with questions. We'll, we'll talk more next time about, about Verilog. <clears throat>